So now that we have a sense of um, uh, what states are and maybe where they came from, three different theories of where they came from, let's talk about what states pay for. In general, states use taxes to pay for services. These services include national security, health, retirement and unemployment benefits, education, and public utilities. National security can also include things, should also include things like within nation security, so policing and military. So you might ask yourself, what are the three most popular programs in the United States and what percentage of the budget they um, uh, take up? Uh, and this is particularly um, uh, uh, for uh, students in the United States. I'll actually give you the answer in a little bit. So think about you know, what, what are popular government programs and how much do they cost? But the process of a state is really a process of extracting economic surplus and using that surplus to pay for things that are in the public interest or collective good that private things generally don't pay for. So um, we don't really, although we have increasingly started to do this, privatize national security in part because national security is a public good. And public goods are things that are defined by two properties. And this is important. They're non-excludable and they're not subject to crowding. So public goods are non-excludable and they're not subject to crowding. What does that mean? Public goods are not like pie. And by pie, I mean like literally a pie. Like think about an apple pie. So, Pie is both excludable and subject to crowding. If I have an apple pie, I can exclude you from that apple pie. I can say, you don't get any pie, in which case you've been excluded from my pie. Pie is also subject to crowding. If I have pie and I say, everybody gets the pie, and there are five people, then all of us get a lot of pie. If there are 800 people, we're all going to get like a tiny, tiny little bit of pie. So pies are subject to crowding. National security is not like this. Providing national security is not something where you can exclude some people from it. Either the nation is secure or it's not. Um, so kind of tends to be a public good. There are elements of this that are debatable, but overall, think about it this way. The other is that it's not subject to crowding. It's not like if more people are in the country, they don't like there's less national security. You could think about it that way, but it's kind of not the case. Environment is another good example of this. Clean air. If you have clean air, you can't exclude other people from clean air because it's a public good. Like everyone gets it. Clean air also isn't subject to crowding. Like if there's two of me in, in a particular territory, versus 50 of me in a particular territory, we still have the same amount of clean air. We may create more pollution, which is something we could think about with more people. But overall, really, like it's not excludable and it's not subject to crowding. So states often provide public goods, which markets tend not to provide. National security is a good example. Environmental attention tends to be another. Parks um, uh, uh, tend not to be excludable. And, roughly not uh, uh, subject to crowding, especially if you live on the planet. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, they tend to provide these sets of things for people. Now, in the United States, if we look at the federal government, the total um, budget is $4 trillion. And um, that budget, uh, the sort of three biggest line items of it are Social Security, which is the amount of money that the money that's paid to older people um, who are retired as income for them, national defense, and Medicare, uh, which is another form of, of help for older people and increasingly the disabled as well. Uh, so that's health care. So a huge portion of the national budget, about half of it, goes to just these three. Um, Social Security uh, and Medicare are basically programs for the elderly. Uh, so about 1.5 trillion out of the $4 trillion budget goes to people who are retired.
or um, that's rough. Uh, might be a little bit of an overestimate, but it's probably a factor. So um, huge portions of our federal budget basically extract taxes from people who are currently working and distribute them to people who have stopped working and extract taxes from people who are currently working and provide health care to people who are no longer working in general. So one of the things that states do is that they distribute resources to people who tend to be at risk. And older people are at risk of poverty and they're at risk of being sick. And so states sort of engage in a process of socialization of that risk where younger people pay to help older people with that. And the US state and most states are kind of predicated on this basic idea of having uh, uh, taxes be extracted from one group and distributed in general to another. There are um, uh, kind of three types of states overall today. Um, uh, democracies which allow people opportunities to vote for leaders and policies. Socialist nations which can be democracies but where a government has some control over the economy and authoritarian states which are ruled by force by a dictator and or a small group of people. Um, democracies are a relatively recent trend, um, uh, basically starting around 1800. And even democracies are, you know, limited in their democratic uh, uh, um, uh, 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 capacity and um, how democratic they really are. Um, by that I mean that like, um, uh, uh, you know, the US, for example, uh, identifies as a democracy, but um, we should note that the early structure of the United States protected the most important and powerful parts of um, uh, the government from people directly voting. So the presidency is not, and to this day is not based on direct votes or popular votes. Uh, it's based on an electoral college system. So we, it's not just people vote for the president, it's the people in particular areas vote for the president. The, those areas distribute their electoral votes for the president um, and then that is used to elect the president. So um, for example, since uh, 2000, um, there have been multiple elections uh, where uh, the person did not receive the majority of the popular vote. Um, Bush did not in 2000, Trump did not in um, 2016. But the Supreme Court isn't subject to a vote by the people. And until um, the early part of the 20th century, the Senate was not directly voted by the people. Um, and in fact, the president was not initially voted by the people. So if you think about it, the early form of American democracy, the Senate, the presidency, and the Supreme Court, the three most powerful bodies were not directly elected. And today, the president and the Supreme Court still are not directly elected. And so here, democracies allow people the opportunity to vote for leaders, but we need to be clear about what that opportunity means. And people here requires a definition of who those people are. For most of American history, most people were not allowed to vote. So uh, even to this day, uh, in many states, people who were, have, were formally convicted of a felony but are no longer incarcerated are not allowed to vote. People who are incarcerated in most places are not allowed to vote. And so there are huge limitations on who constitutes the people. Women used to not be allowed to vote. Uh, Black Americans were not allowed to vote. There are still lots of restrictions on this. So you should think about this as ideal types. Some socialist nations, for example, are democracies. Some are not. Some authoritarian states are socialist. Some authoritarian states may be democratic. Um, these are ideal forms that give us a rough contour of this. Um, China is a really interesting example of a hybrid market and socialist state, um, a hybrid of socialism and market um, economy. And so it's interesting to think about what it means for these hybrids to exist. This is my way of saying that um, 
you shouldn't think about these in really simplistic terms of democracy means, you know, freedom and people voting, socialism means, you know, government control and authoritarianism uh, uh, basically means a dictator or a tyrant. There's overlap between all of these forms of states. These ideal types are helpful for us to think from. Now, one question is how democracies choose policies. So if you live in a democratic, how is it that policies emerge within those states? So for example, we spend 500 billion on defense rather than, and this slide says video games, because we could spend 500 billion on video games. The question is why? Why do we spend 500 billion on defense? The central theory, and this is one that we will both support and challenge, is that politicians are responsive to voters. They if you pass unpopular laws, you will lose the next election. And so you might ask yourself, what are popular policies right now? And what are popular policies that maybe haven't been realized? And what are unpopular policies? And what are unpopular policies that continue to exist? I'll give you some examples here to help you think for, through this in the US case. I said earlier that abortion is overwhelmingly supported, and it is, and abortion still exists in the United States as something that is legal. Gun control is something that has broad bipartisan support, control over um, uh, people's access to guns. And yet comprehensive gun control rarely emerges on the legislative agenda and often fails. And so we might ask, why is it that gun control fails if the law would be popular. So one major theory of democracy is median voter theory. And the median voter theorem says, if voters care about an issue and you have two politicians that are running, you would expect those two politicians to converge on basically the same policy, a position, because people care about this. So, if people care about taxes, um, what you should see is that like, if half the voters want a tax rate of 30%, then politicians will converge on a tax rate of 30% because that will allow them to win the election. So what happens? Politicians move towards the median voter, the average. Another way of thinking about this is that like, you assume that voters are represented by a distribution of preferences. This is a bell curve. And you'll see this a lot in the social sciences. And it's basically a distribution of preferences. And it assumes that there's like some people at the tails of the distribution. So some people on the extreme left-hand side and some people at the extreme right-hand side. But most people are kind of roughly in the middle. And so you have this overall distribution. And if you assume that voters are represented by this kind of curve, then voters go for the politician that's closest to them. So here we have two different um, uh, politicians, politician A and politician B. And politician A's policy is closer to the median voter than politician B. If you just look at the area of red, it's bigger than the area of blue. Why? Because politician A's policy is closer to what the average person wants. And so A is going to win an election because A is closer to what people on average want. But also, what will happen in a democracy? Both politician A and politician B will move to the same policy in order to capture the most votes. In other words, they're going to move towards the average position because that's how they're likely to win. If a politician doesn't move to the average, to the policy that's on average most people support, then they will not um, uh, uh, win. Um, it's, you know, average here as a median means it's the one that splits the population in half. This is a good model for two-party systems. 
If you have one party, you're not going to find this. And if you have three parties or more, it's not so clear how this theorem works. So this theorem really applies to American political. Now, challenge is like, does this actually describe real democracies? Kind of. Um, it kind of describes American democracies, not really parliamentary democracies. But it does say that like when the public cares a lot about an issue, the state gives them policies that they want. In the US, the median voter says they want that abortion should be legal. That's what the state offers. The thing is that the public doesn't care much about an issue. The state has a lot more options. So another way of thinking about this is that there may be people who care a lot about one issue and not about any other issue. These are called single, single issue voters. And getting those people is, could be really important to being elected. So capturing a single issue voter is super important to getting elected. And those people may have other really unpopular opinions, but as long as you align with what they want, you're gonna capture them. So this is why say gun control exists uh, in the way that it does, which is to say that it doesn't that much in the United States. There are people who really, really care about that issue. And so in order to have them vote for you, you have to do what they want. And then you can capture other voters who care about other issues. So another way of looking at this is that like, there may not, there may be multiple voters with multiple different preferences over multiple different issues. And some of those issues people don't really vote on. A clearer way of seeing this, Americans widely support environmental regulation, but Americans don't vote on the basis of environmental regulation. They don't actually vote on that basis. And so we don't get policies for environmental regulation because no politician is gonna lose their job over not providing environmental regulation. Americans vote on the basis primarily of economic interests, not solely, um, but um, it's, it's a part of it. Um, they also vote on the basis of racial interest, um, of cultural background, et cetera. There's a lot of reasons why people vote. But you know uh, that's one thing. And then the second is if you look at this distribution of preferences, um, it could be that you have very polarized societies. So what if instead of looking like this, it looks like a camel? There's two different humps and like it doesn't actually distribute equally like this. In that case, you're going to get very, very different patterns. So here there are some big exceptions to the median voter theory. On some issues, democratically elected leaders seem opposed to viewers. So for about 10 years now, a majority of voters have supported the relaxing of the drug laws. But the federal government has not done this. And as I've said before, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, drug laws. Uh, uh, gun law is another example of this. Environmental regulation is another example of this. So uh, democratic leaders, if voters have a preference for something, but they don't vote on the basis of that preference, the leaders are unlikely to be that responsive to it. They may be more responsive um, to other smaller groups that say give them a lot of money. Alternate theories to the median voter theory are um, elite theory and pluralism. Elite theory is the idea that a small group of well-connected and influential people choose policies. Um, and so, uh, you know, that um, uh, it's not that politicians are responsive to the average voter, they're responsive to elites. And um, uh, schools are kind of a good way to think about elite theory. So what do public schools teach? Um, uh, uh, the median voter theory would say uh, public schools teach what the typical voter wants. Um, and elite theory would say, no, 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 schools don't teach what the average person wants to learn. They teach what leading scholars think is legitimate, what elites say is important to know. So um, schools may teach a lot of things that people on average don't want to learn. But insofar as there are powerful people in society who say it's important to know it, schools continue to teach it. That's an example. Um, an alternate. Um, uh, uh, view is pluralism. 
And this is the idea that policy is determined by a very specific constellation of groups that are organized around issues. This is the idea of interest group politics and that politics isn't just driven by what on average a, a, what the median person wants. It's instead driven by organized groups that lobby for things and that there are many different groups that have many different interests that are each competing in a political landscape to realize what they want. My position is that all three of these theories explain some policies, but they tend to explain different policies. That in instances where voters are very, very committed to an issue, the median voter theory can be pretty good at explaining what happens. In instances where voters are not particularly committed to an issue, elite theory and pluralism both have some explanatory power. Elite theory saying actually power really matters for what governments do, and that small groups of well-connected influential people can have huge or disproportionate impacts on policies. Another version of elite theory is to say that elites have a big impact on policies, not because of their exercise of power, but because politicians tend to be elites. So the political scientist, Nicholas Carnes, has written a really important book from my perspective called White Collar Government. And what he says is, what he, what he shows in that book is that in the United States, even though the working class makes up a third of Americans, they've never made up more than 3% of Congress. I'll repeat that. The working class, even though they make up a third of Americans, has never made up more than 3% of Congress. So they're 10 times less likely to be Congress people. And so Congress is filled with millionaires. It's filled with people who are really rich. And it's not necessarily the case that the rich have a big influence on policy because they're exercising their power. It's because the frameworks that people who rule have tend to be the frameworks of rich people because we consistently elect rich people. And we might ask, why do we consistently elect rich people? And one of the explanations is that rich people have social connections to other rich people, which help them run campaigns. Um, but part of the idea of this is that it doesn't necessarily mean that elites are kind of pulling the strings like, um, uh, puppet masters over politicians, it could be that politi politicians share the cultural framework and set of ideas that other elites do. Pluralism is just this idea that there are multiple interest groups and organizations that are constantly being politically activated in order to realize their issues, their, their interests over specific policies. And what politicians do is kind of manage those different groups, those organized groups, giving some some things, trading them off with one another in order to get politics done. These three different approaches, the median voter theory, elite theory, and pluralism then are somewhat in competition with one another as explanations, but we could think about how they explain why different kinds of laws get passed. Sometimes because the median voter wants them, sometimes because elites want them, and sometimes because there's a constellation of organized groups advancing the interest of 